Hello, can I welcome you all back? This is the last day of 2020. It's going to be the ninth lecture in the series of lectures which will be given to undergraduates just starting a course in banking and finance. Uh, and it uh, is going to be about uh, uh, central banks and their mistakes. Lecture nine is going to concentrate on deflation and lecture 10 is going to concentrate on inflation. I hope you all recognise me. Uh, uh, my gym buddy came round today, uh, Patsy, to cut my hair and I always ask her to take off a little bit of a uh, little bit extra uh, during this season so I can sprinkle it all over the lawn and uh, the blue tits, uh, robins, wrens, uh, sparrows that uh, uh, nest in the garden can use my hair to for, for their nests uh, which they're starting to build already so I'm doing my bit for recycling and sustainability and all those sorts of things. Um, before we actually start on this lecture I just a couple of definitions we've got to get quite clear uh, because over the uh, next two lectures we're going to talk about deflation and inflation. Now deflation purely and simply is a fall in the average level of prices where inflation is a rise in the average level of prices. Uh, sometimes inflation is confused with reflation which is just expanding demand in the economy. Uh, sometimes deflation is confused with rising unemployment, falling incomes and, and recessions and depressions. I don't want you to make those confusions at all over these next two lectures so I repeat once again Deflation is just a fall in the average level of prices, inflation a rise in the average level of prices. And I will explain to you that these things are totally controlled by central banks. And it is very important for all sectors of the economy, including the financial sector, which we're talking about, that we have stability in terms of prices. So you don't want prices rising on average or falling on average. And it is the responsibility of the central bank because although there are lots of people who disagree with me over this and you must listen to them and make up your own mind, inflation is always more units of money used in the same number of transactions and deflation is always less units of money used in the same number of transactions. Uh, note there uh, the, uh, uh, the thing which uh, applies to both is units of money. And units of money are what is created or managed and controlled by a central bank. Now ideally we want stable prices and if central banks haven't historically uh, produced stable prices then they need some criticism don't they and that's what they're going to get uh, in this particular lecture. Now when I have given this lecture before there's a couple of quotations that I've used uh, um, from John Maynard Keynes, one of my favourite economists uh, even though uh, almost everything his followers the Keynesians say is incorrect uh, then but John Maynard Keynes sort of stood above uh, his, uh, his followers who tended to misunderstand and misuse what he said but there are two things he did say which are quite important uh, and I remind you of them here. One thing he said was the ideas of economists and political philosophers both when they are right and when they are wrong are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed the world is ruled by little else. Now that's important because it said when they are wrong. So economics and economists have a responsibility to get things right. Karl Marx was uh, an economist and arguably he uh, managed to influence a, a very large proportion of the world, uh, brought misery, uh, death to millions and uh, generally didn't produce the type of society that he had hoped to produce. So very powerful but wrong. Keynesians come into the same mould, not uh, uh, quite as extreme as I have just described but they have got things wrong for a number of years. Uh, and uh, influenced uh, economies uh, not unfortunately for the better. So I, let me just remind you how important it is to understand 
economics and to be critical of economists uh, because you hope the ones who get it right are the ones who have most influence but unfortunately that's not always the case. The second um, quote from uh, John Maynard Keynes is very relevant to what we're talking about now uh, in a particular sense rather than the general sense which uh, has just been covered. He said, there is no sure means of overturning the existing basis of society than to debauch the currency. This process engages all the hidden forces of economic law on the side of destruction and does it in a manner which not one man in a million is able to diagnose. Again, very important. Debauching the currency uh, usually would be referring to reducing its value, which means inflation, but I take debauching in this context to, to be inflation or deflation. Uh, both of those, by changing the average level of prices, are very damaging uh, to the economy, and indeed it's very difficult to, for people to understand uh, exactly the cause uh, of these things. So the lecture nine is actually going to be called Central Banks, Deflations and Depressions. Lecture 10, when it appears, uh, will be Central Banks, Inflation, Hyperinflation and Depressions. So unfortunately for the Central Banks, I blame them for both. Uh, but this one we're going to concentrate just on Deflations and Depressions. I gave a lecture oh, a long time ago now, back in 2009, which was entitled Credit Crunches. Why they happen and why they may or may not lead to great depressions. Uh, great was in brackets, uh, depressions uh, uh, would have done, but uh, I was concentrating on a particular depression, uh, as you can imagine. And it's from that I, I really need to develop this lecture because you need to understand firstly what's a credit crunch. Uh, credit crunch is just a contraction in aggregate monetary demand caused by one or more events that damage confidence. They stop banks lending and they cause customers to close accounts and slow the rate at which they spend money. So for a period of time, you might find the velocity of circulation of money slowing and you might find banks uh, stop lending, uh, which reduces the stock of money. We've used this before, but again, just let me remind you, that's monetary demand. The two concentric circles in the middle, there's cash or currency, and around it is all the money that was created by bank lending over the years, over the decades, over a very long period of time. It's not just... Uh, uh, recently. Uh, and the, the red arrows show you how fast it goes round. So monetary demand is made up of that stock, the two concentric circles, and the speed it goes round over time in the economy. And credit crunches are things that happen that either slow the speed the money's going round or reduce the amount of bank lending, both of which reduce monetary demand. Now, Often they're just caused by supply side shocks uh, and they are specific to one currency. Although the impact of, of what happens can spread through different countries, uh, the impact of a supply side shock creating a credit crunch is in relation to uh, one currency. Lots of uncertainty and confusion can cause a credit crunch. Wars can cause a credit crunch. The Cubile, Cubile, Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, death of John F. Kennedy, the 9-11, bursting of asset bubbles, South Seas in uh, 1720, the dot-com bubble more recently, property bubbles, the Suez Crisis, irrational exuberance, which we will come back to, the Asian financial crisis, regulatory problems, regulatory mistakes. All of those things can cause a sudden slowing in monetary demand as people worry about whether this is the beginning of something that is going to be more damaging. So what do you want of your central bank managing your monetary policy? Over the long term, you want it 
to grow monetary demand, which remember is the stock of money and the speed it circulates at a steady and stable rate, just slightly faster than the rate of growth of output. You're going to achieve your inflation target then uh, at 2% or whatever your target is. So over the long term, you want stable prices, which means by definition you must have monetary demand growing in a steady and uh, slow way, just a little bit faster than the economy is growing in real terms. Now over the short term, the central bank must maintain liquidity in the financial system uh, by ensuring all demands for currency are dealt with. Now that's slightly different because if we just look at something which illustrates the stock of money, this is these two uh, concentric circles here. The outside uh, concentric circle is the uh, one that is uh, accounting for the total amount of money in the economy. And the total amount of money in the economy is based upon cash and claims on cash. Everyone who has money, the 95% of money in circulation which isn't actually backed by cash, everyone believes that they could always have that money back in cash whenever they want. So if there are times when demands for cash are particularly high, perhaps it happens at Christmas time, perhaps it happens at the end of the tax season, then the people's demand for cash should be supported by the central bank. That is, they should be pushing a little bit more cash into the system. And then they can take it out again uh, after that at a different point in time in the year. And this is what they used to do with open market operations, which put cash in and took cash out of the economy as required. And it didn't affect the total size of the money supply, but it maintained liquidity in the financial system, which again is all part of the confidence uh, that allows this system to work. So that's the CB responsibility. We want stable prices and we want them to sustain uh, liquidity, that is deal with all demands for cash or currency whenever they take place. Now, do you have to respond to a credit crunch? Because credit crunches go away. They may only be there for a few days. There's a shock to the system and things start to, uh, people react uh, and worry that things are going to uh, get worse into the future. Uh, so the credit crunches may be a few days, they may be a few weeks. If they last a little bit longer, the CB might get involved, the central bank might get in, involved in sort of keeping things uh, stable. Often it will be just a slight loosening of monetary policy. And uh, a loosening of monetary policy could be, again, back to that diagram, it could be pumping more cash into the system, the bit in the middle, uh, or it could be reducing bank rate, trying to reduce interest rates to encourage the outside to grow back a little, uh, to encourage people to borrow money. So uh, you have got the correct response to a credit crunch is one to do nothing, it'll go away. Or if it needs a little bit of encouragement to go away, for a central bank just to loosen monetary policy uh, to counteract, if you like, the pressures that are causing the credit circle to move inwards, just to bring it back out and maintain stability in money supply and hope that the velocity of circulation of that remains similar and stable. So that would be the correct response, and that's the job of the central bank to, to maintain that. Now the next one is, do credit crunches actually cause recessions and depressions in an economy? So let me remind you, well, strictly as an economist, a recession is just two quarters uh, where you have a reduction in uh, GDP or real GDP and a depression is what you get at the end of this when you have uh, successive quarters of recession uh, then you would end up uh, with uh, a slump in the economy, high unemployment, uh, uh, falling incomes uh, and that is uh, uh, your uh, depression. Now credit crunches don't do that because we said that things usually return fairly quickly to normal. So credit crunches don't bring about recessions and depressions unless, and we are going to go through some examples of the unless, uh, it's unless the central bank 
reacts incorrectly. I've described to you how the central bank should act correctly, but if it acts incorrectly, it can cause a problem, and that problem be can become a very big problem. So an incorrect response to some shock to the system, uh, some uh, credit crunch, would be to let the economy deflate. So let this fall in the average level of prices start and continue. And the reason that you don't want it to start is because it does have a sort of self-perpetuating effect on the velocity of circulation of money. Because if you see prices beginning to fall, the money that you hold is going up in value. So you've got a tendency to want to hold on to that money, not get rid of it at the same rate as before. So if you were thinking of, say, buying yourself a property and you see house prices starting to fall, and it's not essential you buy now, you might say, no, I'm going to wait another year. I'll wait and see what the price is like uh, next year as prices are falling. For anything you can put back purchases, you would choose to do so during a period of deflation. That makes it worse. That reduces the velocity of circulation of money and makes the deflation worse than it is. And if you don't reverse the policy, then it takes a long time for an economy to rebalance and get itself back out of a sustained period of deflation. So what you would not want to do under any circumstances as a central bank is aggravate a deflation by getting things wrong. Now, here comes the history lesson and the examples for you. There are three, possibly four occasions. They say possibly four because the fourth one hasn't played out fully yet. There are three, possibly four occasions in the last 100 years and a bit when credit crunches have led to depressions. One was in the UK, UK specific, after World War I. The second one was uh, started in the US, was after the Wall Street crash. The third one was after the global financial crisis, where there was a short-lived concern about deflation. And now we have the, what I would like to think of as the global economic crisis, which is the pandemic. And the pandemic is moving us uh, in that direction. It'll only be temporary. I'll explain why right at the end of this lecture. So what I'm going to suggest to you that in every case of a credit crunch turning into a recession and depression, it was because a central bank made a big mistake. Now let me explain to you what those mistakes are. So the first deflation, which is a considerable fall in the average level of prices, uh, occurred after the First World War in the UK. Before the war started, all sterling was convertible into gold. And there was a ratio, a required ratio, of gold backing paper money in circulation. And that maintained relatively stable prices. Not perfectly stable because gold is not stable in the rate at which it is supplied uh, into the economy, but uh, relatively stable if you compared it with any sort of numbers that you would think for inflation or indeed deflation uh, now. Uh, Sir so Isaac Newton, uh, the uh, physicist, uh, uh, Newtonian physics, was also as his part-time job, he was master of the UK Mint. And he set the sterling price for gold in 1717. And it remained unchanged until 1914. But 1914 was a war. You've got three ways of financing a war. You can ask people to pay more taxes to finance it. You can sell debt to people and say, will you lend us money to finance it? Or, because wars tend to, to be quite quick things and it's necessary to draw resources into the war effort quickly, you can print money. 
you can print money and you can draw all those resources that you need immediately uh, into uh, providing the resources you need to finance a war. And perhaps money printing was the best way to do it uh, because it happens nice and quickly. So what happened is that you printed lots of money to buy resources during the First World War and you didn't have enough gold to back that so you had to suspend the gold standard. So the gold standard was suspended in 1914 and money was printed to finance the war. Now during the war prices rose by more than 100% during those war years because you had more money in circulation to buy goods and services and you had a huge supply shock and disruption to the supply side of the economy. So after the war you've got too much money in the economy in relation to the amount of gold that backs it. So what do you do under those circumstances? Now inflation had adjusted the economy to the higher level of money in circulation. The end of the war sort of initiates a mild credit crunch as this uh, uh, monetary stimulus stops and you've got a decision. What do we do with the fact that we have now, by our own criteria, too much money relative to gold at the Bank of England? One simple one is you can devalue paper money. You know, if one pound sterling bought you four ounces of gold, you can say, well, one pound sterling will only buy you two ounces of gold. So you can devalue paper money. That The problem solves straight away because you re-establish the same ratio between gold and money in circulation, but at a lower price. A second thing is you could destroy all the paper money you created during the First World War um, and... Uh, uh, reduce the amount of paper money in circulation to the same ratio it was before World War I. Or don't return to the gold standard, just stay where you are and just let's have a fiat currency uh, where there is uh, units of money backed by nothing other than other units of money. Now, uh, not returning to the gold standard, devaluate, devaluing money would have been the best way out of that. So you can imagine what happened, can't you? Well, the governor of the Bank of England at that time, he was quoted as saying, the disadvantages to the internal position are relatively small compared to the advantage for the external position of returning to gold at the pre-war rate. Now, about 5% of sterling was held abroad, 95% of sterling was held at home, the governor was worried that the status of sterling around the world would be damaged if we didn't return to the gold standard at the pre-war rate. A Cunliffe committee met and produced a report, as you can imagine, said exactly what uh, the governor of the Bank of England wanted to hear. He supported, uh, oh sorry, it supported the bank uh, and uh, it was decided to return to the pre-war gold standard. Now the only way you could do that was then to destroy the money that you had created during the war. Remember, that money had raised all prices. You're now going to destroy it. So on average, all these prices have to fall again. So how did they do it? They had budget surpluses. The government's fiscal yearly budget produced a surplus and the cash was destroyed, taken out of the economy. So the UK then undergoes deflation. Cash is destroyed, prices fall, wages have to fall. A problem with wages falling, uh, I'll mention it in just a moment, um, strikes, unemployment rises. If you could have done this smoothly, that is on one day you say, right, we're going to contract the amount of money in circulation by 50%. We need all prices to fall today by 50%. We need all wages to fall by 50% uh, and then everything will be as it was. Well, yes, it would actually be like that, but it doesn't happen like that because there is, when it comes to wages, something called the illusion of money. And the illusion of money is uh, the way people look at nominal units of money as opposed to real units of money. That is what you can buy with it. Now, what happens is that uh, if you've got a lower wages, 
and you're in that situation, you're going to have to lower nominal wages and real wages. You lower nominal wages and workers don't like that. They don't like to be given less units of money. So a reduction in their nominal income causes real problems. That, what, that leads to strikes and it leads uh, eventually to rising unemployment because there are different power nodes within the economy uh, and some can maintain their wages at a higher rate, others lose and then others uh, find that their jobs are lost in order to pay the higher wages of the other people whose jobs are not lost. Now you can see the illusion of money. Keynes knew this because in his general theory of employment, interest and money, which was really written uh, as a reaction to what was going on uh, after the First World War, uh, said no, you don't, mustn't do it that way. If you want people's wages to go down, you give them more money. So you give them more money, so they feel better off, they have this illusion of having more units of money, but in the process you cause inflation, which reduces the real value of the money, so you're still cutting their wages, but you're giving them more money to do it. That's what money illusion is, but it doesn't uh, um, help us in this situation because it caused great disturbances in the economy. As I say, when wages fell, you had your strikes, you had your unemployment rising. We did, however, destroy enough money to try and return to the gold standard in 1925. But things tended to get worse. There was a general strike in 1926. In fact, what you had was a decade of deflation in the UK economy and only in the UK economy. So this sort of puts a lie to those people who think that you can uh, receive inflation from other countries or deflation from other countries, you can't. Inflation deflation is what happens in your currency, in your country. Because what happened in the 20s was that Germany, and we're going to talk about this in some detail in the next lecture, uh, Germany had hyperinflation, prices growing at thousands of percent an hour. Um, the USA, Roger Scott Fitzgerald, you know, it's the roaring 20s. Uh, during uh, uh, after the First World War in America, things were uh, really great, as illustrated by uh, the great uh, Gatsby. Warren G. Harding uh, had uh, started the ball rolling uh, early in the 20s by cutting government spending and releasing resources to the, uh, the real economy, the private sector. He was not liked by uh, the people who thought that government should always spend more money uh, when he wanted to spend less. So you'll never see much good written about Warren G. Harding, but he did actually create a situation which caused the Roaring Twenties. In fact, they roared a little bit too much uh, because we'd had the problem from 1918 onwards in the UK and as you go through the 20s, things are getting better and better. But with communications not as great as they are now, things could happen around the world and you wouldn't get full information immediately. Uh, people saw prices rising, people saw share prices rising. And when you see that happening, uh, you think, well, I'm, I'll get into this. I'll put my savings into shares. Uh, and when prices continue to rise, as they will, as more and more people are buying shares, so you think it would be a jolly good idea to borrow money. Uh, I can borrow money at 2 or 3% and I can get my shares growing by 20% a year. Silly not to borrow uh, lots of money. So things did become rather irrationally exuberant, as Alan Greenspan would have said if he had been there at the time. And what you had was the eventual credit crunch, which was the Wall Street crash, which then brought things uh, uh, back down again. And what you had here was an inexperienced central bank. The Federal Reserve had only been set up in 1913, probably didn't know what it was doing uh, and how to do it. And so it had to deal with the Wall Street crash in 1929 and it dealt with it incorrectly, made a really big error. Now, I don't know I mean, sometimes I tell you stories that I'm not totally sure about uh, um, whether they're true or not. But uh, I often wonder whether the Federal Reserve wanted to be called the Bank of the United States. As we have our Bank of England, they wanted the bank to be the Bank of the United States. But when they were set up, they couldn't 
because there was already a bank called the Bank of the United States, which was a private bank. So um, perhaps to them, they got the second best name, the Federal Reserve. Uh, when I was in at the Federal Reserve oh, a long time ago now, I tried to sort of talk about this and, and, and see whether there was any uh, story behind this that I could uh, understand, but no one would say absolutely anything. But I just wonder, because the bank, which had lent lots of money to people to speculate on shares and therefore was in really big trouble after the Wall Street crash, was, believe it or not, the Bank of the United States. And I just wonder if the Bank of the United States went along to the Federal Reserve, uh, cap in hand, asking for help. And uh, the Federal Reserve sort of looked at them and remembered the fact they got the name they wanted and said, no, we're not going to support you. And they didn't. So the Bank of the United States collapsed. And what the Federal Reserve didn't know or didn't take on board correctly is that when one big bank goes down, Lots of people lose confidence in other banks and they go and ask for their money back. They want uh, um, their deposits back in cash and we all know the cash is not there. So other banks can't give you uh, that uh, money back and they then go out of uh, business. So there was a string of bank failures across the USA and a monetary contraction of around 30% which caused the Great Depression. The Great Depression wasn't caused by the Wall Street crash. I don't believe John Kenneth Grell Braith. Uh, it was caused by the Federal Reserve's response to a credit crunch, which was the Wall Street crash. Now, if you want to read about that uh, uh, in detail, then it's all brilliantly set out by Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz in A Monetary History of the United States. So you can read about exactly what I'm telling you. And at that time, of course, the USA was uh, big around the world. And so their problem was a little bit more of a, a world problem rather than just our little uh, deflation that occurred after the First World War. And in fact, throughout the world, uh, you went through a period of time with the Great Depression where unemployment was high, where there were lots of disillusioned people, where there were weak economies, the development of extremist groups, no economic growth, so there's nothing more to share among people. And uh, you could argue that uh, this is going to lead to another war, isn't it? Uh, strangely enough, it did. After that war, neither the UK or the USA made that mistake again, but that'll be part of what I talk about in the last lecture, uh, 10, uh, which will be coming soon. So we've now got two, almost two decades of deflation, really damaging deflations in the world, certainly in the UK through the 1920s and through the rest of the world during the 1930s. Now, it was almost the end of uh, um, deflations leading to depressions, but the Federal Reserve, I'm afraid, again, and the US government regulatory sector uh, made another big howler uh, prior to what we would call the global financial crisis. So during the end of last century and the beginning of this century, then the American government were trying to encourage um, people to borrow money to buy houses, to try and uh, make people house owners. So there were low interest rates, there were high loan to income values for people who wanted to borrow money, um, and there was self-certification. Uh, so there were a lot of people buying property in America who couldn't really afford to buy that property. Mortgage brokers were incentivized to sell mortgages, uh, and once they'd sold the mortgage, uh, they could then sell it again to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. They were government-sponsored enterprises, so they were backed by government. Uh, and it, it led to a situation where a mortgage broker might go to a family just looking at a nice big house and say, would you like to buy that? And they'll say, we'd love it. We can't afford that. And they go, yes, you can. Uh, you know, how much do you think it'll cost you to um, finance a mortgage on this? And I can give you a very nice teaser rate for two years 
can you afford that? And you go, well, yeah, we could actually afford that. And then you go, well, but we can't afford, we won't afford to go back to a higher rate after two years. And they say, well, don't worry, you never know. Because in two years time, your income may have grown, you may have got another job, you're living in a very nice area. After all, all of these things count. So you may be able to afford it. But if you can't, don't worry. Because if you can't, property prices always go up in value. You'll be able to sell it uh, in two years time, pay off the mortgage, uh, and have another big capital gain that you can use to buy your next house. So you really are in a win-win situation. Probably forgetting to tell people that more, uh, property prices can fall as well. But it was so easy to sell and you had a really big booming market in the early 2000s, which the derivatives markets had got into, if you like. The gamblers were now in on this. Uh, because uh, you find yourself in a situation, uh, if, you, if you watch The Big Short, great film to sort of illustrate this point, you can see that people, in a sense, were almost gambling on property prices continuing to go up, and then other people were gambling on them gambling. There is a nice, I can't even remember whether it was a roulette wheel or not, I suspect it was, but you know, someone putting money on... Um, uh, a roulette wheel and someone watching them uh, says I bet they get this wrong and uh, he has a bet with the person next to him who then goes uh, someone else I bet that person who bet on that person got is going to get that wrong and someone else bet so you can build up lots and lots of bets if you like on one event happening so one event might uh, only be a hundred dollars but you could have uh, thousands of dollars bet on the outcome of that, that one. That's the sort of problem that you have and you had as you've got this mushrooming uh, of uh, um, new products, uh, betting on things and then uh, hedging their bets uh, by betting on uh, events that would uh, uh, stop their losses if things went wrong. Uh, and companies were growing very rapidly by what would be called securitizing of assets. And I'll just mention that with regard to the UK, because there's a nice example of, uh, in Northern uh, Rock. Uh, but basically what you've got here is um, lots of assets. You've got assets being recycled. You've got lots of mortgages. Um, you've got Asset bundles, securitized asset bundles, which include not only high rated uh, mortgages, but also toxic mortgages. And people who bought them didn't know because they were recycled through AAA rated companies uh, like Lehman Brothers. And what you find is that the whole thing was unsustainable and the house of cards is going to collapse at some point in the future, as it did and the Federal Reserve and Hank and Tim, uh, they decided to let Lehman Brothers fail. And they let Lehman Brothers fail, I think, because they were an investment bank, not a retail bank. But unfortunately, the links through uh, Lehman Brothers to all these other forms of banks caused uh, a real global financial crisis. It caused um, interbank markets to freeze almost and banks worrying about who's going to be the next one to go down. So you've now got all the characteristics and all the requirements you need for another deflation. And indeed, reading about it at the time, everyone was talking about this being a new Great Depression that will match the 1929 uh, depression after the Wall Street crash. Over in the UK, We'd already had a little problem sort of illustrating this as everything was unfolded and that was with Northern Rock because Northern Rock's growth model was give everyone who wants a mortgage a mortgage and when we run short of funds then we will just securitize a bundle which means putting together say 100 mortgages selling them to someone else and then getting the cash back that we would need to keep growing. Uh, and there was a, a period of time where Northern Rock were, were giving out four out of every five mortgages. And what went wrong was that uh, 
people worried about Northern Rock and its growth model. And uh, Northern Rock was finding it quite difficult to deal with mismatches of funding. That is, it needed more funding, but it hadn't securitized the assets yet uh, to get that funding. It would do, but not yet. So it wanted to go to the interbank market and borrow money. And the interbank market was beginning to become a bit worried and stopped mm. lending. So the process of stopping lending at money meant that there were shortages in that sector. And the uh, Bank of England, in its role as lender of last resort, uh, was uh, lending money to Northern Rock. This meant that people knew about it. It was transparent. People knew that uh, Northern Rock was receiving money from the Bank of England and they became worried and people who had deposits at Northern Rock started to take those deposits out, which meant that Northern Rock became more and more shorter and shorter of cash. So more was required from the Bank of England uh, and eventually uh, things went wrong uh, and that preceded the big bust, if you like, Lehman Brothers failing, but it was all part of the same process. So what you have now then is all the characteristics that you would expect will lead to a deflation. So what did the central banks do? Uh, well, I have already explained when I talked about the Bank of England that they responded incorrectly and they did it by trying to push out this part of money, the outside bit, because their argument was that with banks reducing their lending, then this was going inwards. All we've got to do is reduce interest rates and push it back out again. So uh, what they did was reduce bank rate from 5.75% all the way down to 0.5%, uh, uh, almost a ZERP policy, a zero interest rate policy. And that was good for asset prices because uh, we know there's an inverse relationship between interest rates and asset prices, which if you reduce interest rates will cause uh, bubbles in asset prices. But it didn't do much for the economy uh, because uh, banks didn't lend. Banks were a little bit worried after the Northern Rock situation and decided to um, rebuild their balance sheets, that is hold more cash against the assets that they had got. Uh, so the uh, problem of deflation didn't go away, despite the fact that asset prices recovered and uh, share prices were booming. You still had worry about deflation. And in fact, you had uh, a couple of months where the average level of prices did fall. So what the Bank of England decided then is that we had better pump some money in the middle here, pump some money into the cashier and push it all outwards, pump it here. Uh, and that was the quantitative easing program, the asset purchase scheme, which meant that uh, government securities already in circulation were bought back by the Bank of England and cash was pumped into the system to push this one out. And I'll argue that the low interest rates and the misuse of QE uh, was a mismanaged monetary policy that really created uh, a decade of recession and depression uh, right up to almost now. So it was really the threat of deflation that caused the incorrect mistakes uh, that were made by the Bank of England rather than the actual deflation. Remember, deflation had gone on for years after the First World War in the UK and after uh, the Wall Street crash in America. Now they really just went, the deflation was for months because the reaction was much quicker to not have the same problem that you had before. But in my judgment, the reaction was wrong. Uh, and there will be, again, more about that uh, in the next lecture, because what we're saying at least for the first two deflations and depressions, uh, is that uh, the deflation caused the depression. Could those deflations have been avoided? Well, of course they could, uh, because the UK uh, need not have destroyed money. It could have devalued uh, against the gold standard or left the gold standard and just had a fiat currency. 
the US, uh, it could have supported um, the uh, United Bank of the United States. It could have supported other banks and maintained liquidity within the banking system and not allow the uh, money supply to contract by as much as it did. Now, the next problem that we have uh, is now, 2020. It's the pandemic. The pandemic is a global economic crisis, and it's a global economic crisis that could bring about another deflation. The reason is that if you think of um, our monetary demand as being a stock of money and a s the speed it goes round, is that the way of dealing with the pandemic has been lockdowns. Now, during those lockdowns, there has been a lot more government spending, no increases in taxation, a lot more government spending, which is financed by money printing. Now, that money printing is a plus number. So there's an increase in the money stock in the economy. But lock down people and you slow down the speed they can pass it on from one person to another. So the velocity of circulation of money slows. Now, the effect of more M and less V is indeterminate as far as prices are concerned. Prices could fall, or they could rise, or they could uh, rise more slowly. It depends upon the plus and the minus here. So the lockdown, we're increasing M, but we're reducing V. So we could get, over the next few months, the early months of uh, 2021 now, uh, we could get a deflation but it won't last for long. It won't last for long because as soon as you return to normal, no more lockdowns, people back doing things as they normally did, the velocity of circulation of money will pick up. You can't get rid of the additional, uh, well, sorry, you can, but they won't get rid of the additional money that has been printed uh, at the back end of 220. Uh, 2020. So M will be a plus now and V will be a plus now. And M and V together uh, will uh, produce inflation. And it will probably produce what we will get in 2021, which is nicely described as uh, stagflation, something we had in the 1970s and something our describe in the very last lecture for you, uh, so that we have uh, a situation which is worries now about the economy contracting, a big supply shock caused by the pandemic, a lot more money printed, but people not having the opportunity to spend that money, slowing the velocity of circulation. So monetary demand could be growing slowly, could be falling, and if it's falling, it will create another deflation. It'll be the fourth deflation in uh, the last hundred years or so that we uh, have talked about. So the global financial crisis, the global economic crisis, uh, they've threatened deflation rather than caused sustained periods of deflation. However, the response to this threat is still wrong. It's going to cause recession and probably depression. And what we'll, we'll do is look at this in more detail in the last lecture in this series, Lecture 10, uh, where we're going to look at the last few hundred years this time over many countries and how their central banks have destabilised money by causing inflation, which in some occasions has turned into hyperinflation, and the thing about depressions is that they occur with inflation or deflation. You were misled by Keynesians who tend to talk about deflation 
causing depressions and inflations being the things that expand the economy, create jobs, create incomes. That's not the case. Uh, it is the case, and the 1970s in the UK particularly is a good example of this, uh, the uh, expansion that took place too quickly and caused inflation to rise also caused a depression. So I would like to think as an economist uh, that uh, inflations and deflations, any monetary destabilizations, will always end up in depression. They never do anything particularly uh, helpful to the economy. So I look forward to uh, seeing you for lecture 10, uh, where we will look at the inflation side of monetary mismanagement by central banks. Thank you for listening. Speak again soon.